So I'm actually pretty excited about today's video because it's the first time that I've ever put together not just a gaming system, but an entire PC gaming setup for a fixed budget. And that budget's gonna be $1,500. That $1,500 is gonna have to include not just the entire PC, but the operating system and all the peripherals as well. Now, since we have a fairly limited budget considering how many things we're getting, this isn't gonna be the prettiest looking, most you know matchy matchy RGB looking system that I've ever built by a long shot. But that's because I prioritized performance and function above all else. So bear that in mind as we go about this. $1,505 is what the total came out to be at the time of filming. Bear in mind those prices are subject to change based on deals and fluctuation of the market and stuff. But for the most part, I think we did a pretty good job considering the type of experience we'll be able to pull off by the time this video is done. So with that said, let's talk about the PC parts first. So it's probably not a huge surprise that I decided to go with Ryzen 3000 for today's system. Overall, it's just got really solid performance, great value, good bang for the buck, and uh, I could see really no better option for our price point today than the Ryzen 5 3600. This is a six core, 12 thread CPU. Oh, I should also mention that this does include an AMD Wraith Stealth Cooler. It's low profile, it's not anything fancy. You couldn't do any crazy overclocks with it, but it's certainly adequate. That's, that's what I wanted to show you guys. Uh, it's certainly adequate for the... Wow. It's an adequate cooler for the CPU it ships with, but more importantly, it saves us quite a bit of coin that we can distribute to other parts of the build. Our motherboard is the MSI MPG X570 Gaming Plus, and I gave the motherboard chipset a lot of consideration. I almost went B450 because it would have saved me 20, 30 bucks easily. However, I opted for X570 for a number of reasons. The first one being scalability. Uh, this actually had a bit more robust of a VRM solution than any of the B450 boards that would have actually saved me money. And I felt if we ever wanted to scale up again to a higher core count CPU, that this board would be much more equipped to handle that job than one of the cheaper B450 boards I was considering. Additionally, we have support for PCIe Gen 4, which is not something that we're gonna be taking advantage of today, but later down the line, if the user wants to get into that, if they can actually benefit from a really fast storage setup, I wanted that option to be available to them. Finally, and I think most importantly, X570 supports faster memory frequency than B450. And as we all know by now, Ryzen really benefits uh, significantly from fast memory speeds. So having that X570 board has allowed us to go with a 3600 megahertz kit of Sniper X DDR4 from G-Skill. This is a 16 gigabyte kit. Uh, we've got two 8 gig sticks. Moving on in no particular order here, we have Team Group's MS30 SSD. This is an M.2 drive, but it is SATA 3, 6 gigabit per second. However, M.2 means no cable clutter, and it's a much easier installation in my opinion. Plus, we're getting a generous one terabyte capacity that would have cost us a bit more had we gone NVMe. And to be frank, I think SATA Rev 3 is still plenty fast for the average gamer here in 2019. For our power supply, I went with the Seasonic S12 3 650 watt unit. This is 80 plus bronze. Seasonic makes fantastic units. This is not modular, however, which is kind of a bummer. Fortunately, our case is gonna uh, take care of that excess cabling with the, with the power supply shroud, but the cables are black, so we will not have to succumb to awful ketchup and mustard cables inside of our build. Now, our GPU could have gone a number of different ways. There was the RX 590 that was considered, even the, uh, the Radeon RX Vega 56, which has seen a significant price drop recently recently would have actually been uh, a good contender as well. But in the end, I opted for the newer GTX 1660 Ti from EVGA. This is their SC Ultra. It's got two fans that fire downward on heatsink with several heat pipes. It's a relatively short card, so it fits in a variety of cases, and it's a very nice looking shroud, one of the nicer looking 1660 Ti's on the market, in my opinion. And I also like the fact that this is a newer card that still has uh, maybe some driver optimizations ahead of it that could improve the performance over the next year or so. And additionally, it gets your foot in the door to the RTX suite of technology like ray tracing and so forth. So altogether, very excited to use this card today. Finally, that takes us to our case, which is the Fantex P400A. Now it comes in a couple flavors, this case. Uh, one is the digital RGB fan version that costs a little bit more. I opted for the non-digital RGB version that only includes one non-RGB fan at the front and one more at the back, which I think is gonna be fine, honestly, because we don't really have super hot running components in this relatively mid-range PC. And we have a super fine mesh panel at the front of the case that pretty much goes entirely from top to bottom. So virtually unimpeded airflow here. Same great interior layout as the uh, the P400 that came before it. We have a tempered glass side panel, power supply shroud, and plenty of radiator mounting options if we ever wanted to water cool uh, down the line. Presumably it would be uh, for a CPU that has a bit more heat up within this one. So those are all the parts for today's build that we're working with today. If you guys want links to any of this stuff, I'll drop it in the description below. And like I said, once I assemble this, we'll talk about the peripherals, put everything together, and take it for a whirl. Should be pretty fun. All right, let's build this thing.
Okie dokie, the build's complete and it's looking really good. I think it, uh, it turned out great, honestly. You can definitely feel a lot of air coming through the front there. It's dead quiet. I mean, you can't hear the case fans at all. Like even my ear three inches away from it, completely silent. And then these are zero decibel fans, so they're not even spinning at idle. This chipset fan, um, it does go on and off even at idle, but it's, it's spinning at such a low RPM that that's also virtually silent. The only thing I can hear in this system right now is the Wraith Spire. And even that is just down to a faint whisper. This is of course without any side panel. So once the side panel's on, dead silent, but rest assured once this thing's under load, we get it all up and running with some games. I'll let you guys know exactly how it sounds at that point. Apart from that, I also did notice we actually have an additional four pin connector for our, our CPU, which is great. That means that if we were to upgrade our CPU down the line to a higher core count chip, that we would have a bit more power uh, going to the CPU for extra stability when we're overclocking and things like that. Now a weird quirk with this motherboard is that if you look at the M.2 cover here, you see how there's like one mounting screw right here. Well, that mounting screw actually goes in to the center, the center motherboard standoff. So that standoff actually has threads in it. Uh, it actually comes included with, with the motherboard. So you can't mount the M.2 cover until you've installed the motherboard into the case, which I thought was really weird. Moving on to our peripherals, we're going to start off with the awkward one first, mainly because I don't have it on hand. I, I requested it from Corsair. It's a Corsair M65 Elite RGB, but it either didn't arrive or it did arrive and I just can't find it. At any rate, this is my personal mouse that I use every day. This is an M65 RGB. I think it's the Pro, but it's very similar. It's got the same shape, which I absolutely love. It's more or less an FPS mouse. So if you wanted something more MMO centric, you might want to look elsewhere, but it's got that sniper button, front and back buttons, adjustable DPI. The Elite has an 18,000 DPI laser sensor on it. Omron switches, they feel very, uh, very clear clicky, uh, perfect resistance, very nice scroll wheel, braided cable, USB 2.0 connector, and a tunable weight system on the bottom, which is oh so nice to have. So altogether, uh, a very nice mouse. I mean, despite how saturated the gaming mouse market is, it was actually relatively easy for me to make my decision with the M65 Elite RGB. Moving on to our keyboard, I picked an option that's been out for a while. It's not the latest and greatest by any means, but it also has all the things that I was looking for in a good, reliable keyboard. For example, genuine Cherry Mech switches, that was requirement number one. In my opinion, there's just no great alternative right now. It's a must have, it's a must have in my book. The second requirement was a 10 key number pad. I absolutely need one of these because I do more on a computer than just game. Whether it be punching numbers into Excel or number crunching on a calculator, uh, this is super nice to have. And then the third requirement was LED backlighting. I didn't need it to be RGB. Again, this is a no frill setup. We're just trying to get the most functionality possible. I didn't care what color it was as long as there was some illumination because it is nice to have when you're gaming in the dark or a dimly lit environment. So after over an hour of tireless searching, this ended up being the cheapest keyboard that ticked all three of those boxes. And on top of that, you're also getting some nice additional features as well, like dedicated media controls, like you've got volume and stuff. There's also Windows lock key, full in key rollover, 100% anti-ghosting, a USB braided cable, and the list goes on. Moving on to our headset. This is uh, another personal device of mine that I, I use regularly. It's the Corsair Void Pro RGB wireless. Now, I think out of all the peripherals, headsets make the most sense to be wireless, mainly because the wire is a bit harder to manage when the device is on your head, as opposed to on your desk. And also the slight latency that's incurred isn't going to be as damaging to your gameplay as say with your mouse or your keyboard, for example. The price has also dropped significantly since it initially launched uh, about a year or two ago. You're getting an extremely comfortable headset. I mean, I could wear this thing literally all day. Uh, the microphone is not the best. That's probably the weakest link of the entire headset. There's also RGB lighting on the sides of the ear cups, which you won't be able to see when you're wearing these, but everyone else will, and they'll be totally jealous. To be fair, there are cheaper gaming headsets out there, uh, but there's not quite as many super cheap wireless gaming headsets that perform quite as well as this one. Finally, we have our monitor. This is the MSI Optics MAG 271 CQR 27 inch curved VA display at 2560 by 1440, 144 Hertz, one millisecond with AMD FreeSync. And this is a G-Sync compatible display, so we shouldn't have any problem leveraging adaptive V-Sync with our GTX 1660 Ti. Now the fact that this is a VA panel means that the viewing angle isn't quite as good as an IPS display. So if you're looking at the center of the screen, you might notice that the, the quality of pixels on the edges of the monitor might not be quite as sharp as what you're seeing in the middle. But the trade-off here is contrast ratio. We're actually getting much better contrast on a VA panel like this than an equivalent IPS display. So black levels, for example, especially when you're in a dimly lit environment, are going to be far better than an IPS monitor in the same class. So there's a bit of trade-off there on both sides, but at the end of the day, considering all the features that you're getting, there's few options that offer this many features in a single package for the price. Again, links to all this stuff can be found in the description below, but I think I'm ready to to set up this setup and see how it goes. So let's do that. So 
So I've opened up Far Cry 5. We're running at 2560 by 1440, and we are running at high settings right now. Actually, let's let's try Ultra. Let's just go balls to the wall and see what happens. The CPU is not overclocked. I did, however, manually overclock the GPU with a core clock offset of 120 megahertz and a memory clock offset of 700 megahertz. So I'm just gonna go run around here like an idiot and show you guys how much I suck at video games. Um, but uh, you can kind of see that we're getting anywhere from 60 to 70 FPS. Far Cry 5 is a super demanding game. It definitely doesn't hold any punches, but I sort of wanted to put this system through its paces and see what it's capable of. And uh, this is looking pretty good so far. I would like to see, however, what we're getting at high settings. I generally prefer slightly higher frame rates if possible. So let's do high, see what that does. Looks like we've gone up roughly, I wanna say like eight to 10 FPS. So yeah, that actually helps a lot and the game still looks very crispy. So my initial impressions of the setup so far is that it's good. I mean, starting with the PC, I, we're getting really nice frame rates. I'm really happy with this, especially at 1440p in a game like this. The GPU is actually looking really good too. We're getting around 75, 76C. Uh, it's not the coolest I've seen, but it's a really small card. If the cooler was a bit bulkier, it might run a little cooler, but 76 is definitely not bad. For some reason, Afterburner's not letting us monitor CPU temperatures. So I do have Hardware Info 64 pulled up here. Uh, our max temp is 84C, which is a bit toasty. But you can see here, well, it's really tiny, you can't really see probably, but we're averaging it anywhere from 74 to 75C. So the 84 seems to be more of an outlier, like that was just the peak temp at one point, but we're operating more or less in the mid 70s, which is not too bad, especially considering the, the AMD stock cooler that we're using. That being said, it is a little bit noisy now. Now that we're under load, that fan is working overtime to keep that CPU cool, all 12 of those threads. So one of the first upgrades that I would consider making would be an aftermarket cooler, just to bring the temperatures down a little bit and also to keep the system a bit quieter. It's not super noisy by any stretch, but it, it's definitely audible. The last thing to address here is the monitor. I guess I'll start with the good stuff first. I am in love with how fast it is. It is incredibly responsive. 144 hertz with one millisecond response time just makes for an incredibly fluid uh, experience. There's virtually zero motion blur and altogether it just makes it uh, a really great panel for uh, really fast paced shooters, FPS and stuff like that. Now it does have that 1800R curve, which I'm usually not a big fan of uh, curves on 16 by nine panels. I feel like they do better on 21 by nine at least, um, but this, uh, this curve is very subtle and I almost don't notice it, which kind of makes it pointless in a way. So like, I, I don't really see a value in having the curve on this display. Play. But that said, I'm glad that it's not super aggressive uh, because if it were, I'd, I'd want the panel to be a bit wider. I do have FreeSync enabled on the monitor and I was able to get adaptive refresh rate working no problem on this display, which is fantastic. I mean, there's zero tearing whatsoever, no stuttering. It's it's exactly what you'd expect uh, with this technology. Uh, the one thing that I will say I am not super stoked about is the, the color reproduction. It's obviously not quite as, as good or accurate as IPS. So if you're, if you're looking for the best color, then this particular VA panel is probably not gonna be it. And of course, this is coming from someone who uses an IPS display every day, but that display is also triple the price of this one. So you have to take that into consideration as well. Apart from that though, I'm really happy with how the setup turned out. The fact that we're able to get the PC and all the peripherals operating system for $1,500 out the door is uh, just incredible, especially considering how fluid the gaming experience is. It just goes to show how many great options there are in the PC gaming market right now compared to a year or two ago during the crypto mining phase. Your dollar definitely goes a lot further here in 2019. But that's all she wrote, folks. And of course, there's a million different ways we could have done all of this. So if you guys have any thoughts on how you might have done it differently, feel free to share down below. But that's gonna do it for me, guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. Toss a like on it before you go and get subscribed for more tech stuff coming at you really soon. Have a good one, guys. I will see y'all in the next video.